Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, very nice to be here today. Uh, as you can probably tell, I know you're all from all different schools, but as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not from London at all. I'm from Dublin. Anybody here been to Dublin? Yeah. Any, yeah? <laughs> Any, anybody? Oh, you're from Cork? Yeah. Anybody from Dublin? A couple of people? Good. Okay. Well, Dublin is the best city in the world. It's even better than Cork, I'm afraid. So... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about writing, about how I got into writing and the books I've written. And this one in particular, Stay Where You Are and Then Leave. And I'm going to read you a section from this. Uh, but then I'm going to leave most of it open to you for questions about books and writing and boy in the striped pajamas and whatever you want to ask about. So get thinking about questions while I'm, while I'm talking at the start. Um, so when I think back to how I started as a writer, I, 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 I wanted to be a writer really from the time I was about seven years old. And just all the young people here in the audience, how many of you are writing at the moment? Writing stories? Come on, there must be some of you. Yeah, quite a few. Oh, loads of you. Okay. This side seems to be winning it. Okay. And how many of you think you'd like to be writers when you grow up? You'd like to write novels? Yeah? How many of you would like to make movies? How many of you would like to be in movies? Yeah, that's usually the way that it works. Um, okay, well, I wanted to write from the time I was about seven. Reading and writing were always completely connected to me in my mind. When I was your age, uh, you know, we didn't have things like computers and DVDs and Playstations, um, all those kind of things. I know it's, somebody's eyes went wide, uh, that concept. But um, I spent most of my time in uh, the library. I, I lived down the road from a really fantastic library in Dublin. And every week in school, we used to get a half day in school on a Wednesday. Every Wednesday, we'd finish at half time. And my mum used to bring me down to the library to get three books out. And I used to really, really look forward to it. It was a highlight of my week. And before we would go on our summer holidays, uh, rather than go to the library, we could go to the bookshop and we could buy three books, which is even more exciting. And I used to buy those books and I, would use, I used to keep them really, really careful. And um, I wouldn't start them until we actually got where we were going. I was always liked books as a physical object as much as anything. Um, but I used to spend so much time in the library reading so many books, and reading and writing seemed to me that you couldn't do one without doing the other. So when I would read books that I really liked and I'd get some emotion from, whether it meant um, they made me laugh or made me sad or made me scared, uh, I wanted to reproduce that in some way. So I used to take characters from the books I was reading and I would write new stories for them, which is basically called plagiarism, and you can get sued for it, but um, it didn't seem to matter to me at the time. It was almost like kind of a, an old-fashioned version of what now on the internet is called fan fiction. You know, taking things that already exist and writing new stories about them. And for all of you who put your hands up and said you'd like to be writers someday, it's actually a really, really good way to start because the characters exist, and you have to learn how to write plots and how to write dialogue and how to write themes. So if one thing that you can steal from somebody at the start is someone else's characters, well, that's OK. Um, I've gone into a lot of schools over the years where a, a lot of people your age have often written alternate endings, maybe, to some of the books I've written, particularly maybe Boy in the Striped Pajamas. And you know, that's doing that. That's taking characters from books, a book that exists, and, and rewriting it. Which, uh, and I get a lot of that in the post, actually, people sending me different endings and sequel-type things, which I think is always really fun to read. So I started writing then, and I knew all the way through my teenage years that I wanted to continue, that this was what, it just felt inside me, this was what I was supposed to do. Some people are really, really lucky that you know inside you from the start what it is you're supposed to do with your life. And then some people are even luckier again that you're, you seem to be able to do it, which is the thing. But of course, you have to practice it. And all through my teens, I was writing short stories every single day. I must have written about 200 short stories. I was just sitting down every day writing. And you know, a lot of people say they might like to be writers, but they're not actually writing. And it's impossible to be a writer if you're not writing. It's like wanting to be a footballer and not going out every day and practicing football. So you have to sit down and write every day. You can't wait for inspiration to strike. I write every day, every single day, including Christmas Day. I try to get a little bit down of what it is I'm writing. And um, if, you, if you wait for inspiration, it's probably never going to come, you know? So if you sit down, you put down a sentence, it'll lead you somewhere else. Some days you'll only get maybe a page out of it. Some days it'll open the floodgate and you'll get lots out of it. So you have to, you know, two major things in writing 
reading all the time, and writing all the time. Now, I started writing novels then when I was in my 20s, but I started in a different way than my life is now, because the first four novels I wrote, the first four novels I published, uh, they all had something in common, which was they were all written for adults. They were all quite long books. They were all set in the past. And I thought that was what uh, my life was really going to be. I was going to write these kind of big books for adults, and, and that would be fine. That's what I always wanted to do. I had never thought for a moment throughout all those years of wanting to write, I'd never thought about writing for young people. That just simply never crossed my mind any more than, you know, I was never really interested in science fiction, for example, and it never really crossed my mind to write sci-fi. So I'd never thought about writing for young people. But one of the things that can happen to you as a writer is you can get an idea for something, and it leads you to a story. And the story kind of overwhelms you, it overtakes you, and it leads you into a part of writing that you just hadn't expected at the start. And that's what happened to me in uh, 2005, when uh, I had an idea for a story. Well, I didn't know if it was a short story or what it was, but it was a very simple image in my head of two boys sitting at a fence talking to each other. And I knew immediately where that fence was. I knew what they were doing there. I knew it was a place that nobody should be, let alone two little boys. But I was immediately interested in the journey that they would go on to arrive there and the conversations they would have and um, the necessary end I felt their story would reach. And usually with books, I think about them for quite a long time before I sit down and start writing them, which is quite sensible. But with this one, I didn't. Um, the idea seemed really, really powerful to me. I had this idea on a Tuesday night. And on Wednesday morning when I woke up, it seemed so powerful that I just sat down and I just started writing. And I didn't know where it was going to take me. I knew very little about the book. Um, I just started. By the time Wednesday evening came along, the story had overwhelmed me so much that I thought if I walked away from it, I was going to lose that story. So I wrote all the way through Wednesday night, I wrote through Thursday, I wrote all the way through Thursday night, and then on Friday at lunchtime, I finished the first draft of what became The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. So earlier in that week, I'd never thought of the story, and by the end of the week, I'd written it. And that moment, that week, you know, really changed my life considerably. You know, two and a half days, no sleep, and you write something that, you know, does change your life. It was a great experience. But when that book came out, and when it took off, it's it made me realize that actually this was a part of writing that I wanted to investigate more, that I wanted to devote more of my time to. So since then, I've moved back and forth. I've written a book for adults, and then I write a book for young readers. And when I look towards the future, that's what I still see myself doing. Now, the difference between writing for adults and children is um, there isn't a huge amount other than the fact that all my adult books seem to have, they all seem to be first person. So I'm sticking with one character and seeing everything through that person's eyes and getting quite deep into the psychology of a character. But the books I write for your age group, they're always third person. I feel I need a distance between me and the young character. And the characters are always an eight or nine-year-old boy at the center of the story. They all seem, in the four books I've written for young people, they all seem to have something in common. They're, they're always optimistic boys. They're always very good-hearted. They're always um, full of humor. They're always really, really good readers. They're always put in a situation historical situation, usually, that is um, very difficult and that they have to understand and you know, cope with in some way. But also, they're alone. They're always alone. In Boy in the Striped Pajamas, Bruno is pretty much ignored by his family. In Noah Barleywater Runs Away, he's running away from his family. In the terrible thing that happened to Barnaby Brockett, he's exiled from his family because of his, the fact that he's different. And in this new book, um, Stay Where You Are and Then Leave, this is a novel set during the First World War, and it's a boy who's really left alone. This novel starts on the 28th of July, 1914, which is the day that the First World War broke out. So almost 100 years. It'll be 100 years in about, what, eight, nine months from now. And it's about a boy who has a very happy family life. He lives in London with his mother and his father. His father's a milkman. His mother stays at home minding him. And the war breaks out. His father signs up. And we very quickly, it starts when he's only five years old, but we quickly move forward four years to the closing months of the war when the little boy, Alfie, is nine years old and life has changed completely. His father has gone missing. Nobody see, well, he doesn't know where he is, but the adults around him seem to know everything, but nobody will tell him. His mother is working as a nurse. She's working maybe 12, 14 hour days and never really sees Alfie. She's trying to earn enough money to, to feed him, to feed herself. So Alfie is pretty much left alone in the world. 
And what he does is he finds a shoe shine box and he goes down to a King's Cross train station every day and he sits there and he shines shoes. And he watches as the soldiers board the trains when they're going to training. He watches when the soldiers are coming back on crutches, maybe with limbs missing. He watches when parents are coming to collect their sons from the trenches who have come back and the, the pain and the, the horror in their eyes. And he's observing all of this and he's trying to understand the war. And through all of this, he's trying to understand what might have happened to his father. So I'm going to read you a section from the, um, from the opening chapter of the book. All the chapters in this book are named after songs which were written or were popular during the First World War. And this opening chapter is called Send Me Away with a Smile. Every night before he went to sleep, Alfie Summerfield tried to remember how life had been before the war began. The fighting had started on 28th of July, 1914. Others might not have remembered that date so easily, but Alfie would never forget it, for that was his birthday. He had turned five years old that day, and his parents threw him a party to celebrate, but only a handful of people showed up. Granny Summerfield, who sat in the corner, weeping into her handkerchief and saying, we're finished, we're all finished, over and over, until Alfie's mom said if she couldn't get a hold of herself, she would have to leave. Old Bill Hemperton, the Australian from next door, who was about 100 years old and played a trick with his false teeth, sliding them in and out of his mouth using nothing but his tongue. Alfie's best friend, Kalina Janacek, who lived three doors down at number six, and her father, who ran the sweet shop on the corner and had the shiniest shoes in London. Alfie invited most of his friends from Damley Road, but that morning, one by one, their mothers knocked on the Summerfield's front door and said that little so-and-so wouldn't be able to come. It's not a day for a party, is it? Asked Mrs. Smith from number nine, the mother of Henry Smith, who sat in the seat in front of Alfie in school and made at least ten disgusting smells every day. It's best if you just cancel it, dear. I'm not cancelling anything, said Alfie's mother, Margie, throwing up her hands in frustration. If anything, we should be doing our best to have a good time today. And what am I to do with all this grub if no one shows up? Alfie followed her into the kitchen and looked at the table where corned beef sandwiches, stewed tripe, pickled eggs, cold tongue, and jelly deals were all laid out in a neat row with tea towels over the top to keep them fresh. I can eat it, said Alfie, who liked to be helpful. Ha, said Margie, I'm sure you can. You're a bottomless pit, Alfie Summerfield. I don't know where you put it all, honest I don't. When Alfie's dad, Georgie, came home from work at lunchtime that day, he had a worried expression on his face. He didn't go out to the backyard to wash up like he usually did, even though he smelled a bit like milk and a bit like a horse. Instead, he stood in the front parlor reading a newspaper before folding it in half, hiding it under one of the cushions and coming into the kitchen. All right, Margie, he said, pecking his wife on the cheek. All right, Georgie. All right, Alfie. All right, Dad. Out, out, shouted Margie, waving her hands to usher them back into the front parlor. Alfie's mum always said there was nothing that annoyed her more than having her two men under her feet when she was trying to cook. And so Georgie and Alfie did what they were told, playing a game of snakes and ladders at the table by the window as they waited for the party to begin. Dad, said Alfie. Yes, son. How was Mr. Asquith today? Much better. Did the vet take a look at him? He did, yes. Whatever was wrong with him seems to have worked its way out of his system. Mr. Asquith was Georgie's horse. Or rather, he was the dairy's horse, the one who pulled Georgie's milk float every morning when he was delivering the milk. Alfie had named him the day he'd been assigned to Georgie a year before. He'd heard the name so often on the wireless that it seemed it could only belong to somebody very important, and so decided it was just right for a horse. Did you give him a pat for me, Dad? I did, son. Alfie smiled. He loved Mr. Asquith. He absolutely loved him. Dad, said Alfie. Yes, son. Can I come to work with you tomorrow? Georgie shook his head. Sorry, Alfie. You're still too young for the milk float. It's more dangerous than you realize. But you said I could when I was older. Sorry, son, said Georgie. You're still not old enough. Do you remember when you were five? Asked Alfie. I do, son. That was the year my old man died. That was a rough year. How did he die? Down the mines. What happened then? 
Georgie thought about it for a moment and shrugged his shoulders. When we moved to London, didn't we? He said. Your granny Summerfield said there was nothing in Newcastle for us anymore. She said if we came here, we could make a fresh start. She said I was the man of the house now. You'll be able to stay up late tonight, won't you, Dad? Alfie asked. Just for you, I will. Since it's your birthday, I'll stay up till nine. How does that sound? Alfie smiled. Georgie never went to bed any later than seven o'clock at night because of his early starts. I'm no good without my beauty sleep, he always said, which made Margie laugh. And then he would turn to Alfie and say, your mum only agreed to marry me on account of my good looks. But if I don't get a decent night's sleep, I get dark bags under my eyes and she'll run off with the postman. I ran off with a milkman and much good it did me, Margie always said in reply, but she didn't mean it because then they'd look at each other and smile. And sometimes she would yawn and say she fancied an early night too. And up they'd go to bed, which meant Alfie had to go to bed too. And this proved one thing to him, that yawning was contagious. Despite the dis disappointing turnout for his birthday party, Alfie tried not to mind too much. He knew that something was going on out there in the real world, something that all the adults were talking about, but it seemed boring, and he wasn't really interested anyway. They'd been talking about it for months. The grown-ups were forever saying that something big was just around the corner, something that was going to affect them all. When the party started, everyone tried to be cheerful and pretend it was a day just like any other. But soon the adults stopped talking to the children and huddled together in corners with glum expressions on their face, while Alfie listened in and tried to understand what they were talking about. You're better off signing up now before they call you, old Bill Hemperton said. It'll go easier on you in the end. Mark my words. Be quiet, you, snapped Granny Summerfield. Georgie's not signing up for anything. Might not have a choice, Mum, said Georgie. Shush, not in front of Alfie, said Margie. I'm just saying this thing could run and run for years. I might have a better chance if I volunteer now. No, it'll all be over by Christmas, said Mr. Janicek. That's what everyone is saying. The day ended with Alfie's mum sitting in the broken armchair in front of the fireplace, sobbing as if the end of the world was upon them. Come on, Margie, Georgie said, standing behind her and rubbing her neck. There's nothing to cry about, is there? Remember what everyone said? It'll be over by Christmas. I'll be back here in time to help stuff the goose. And you believe that, do you? Margie said, looking up at him, her eyes red-rimmed with tears. You believe what they tell you. What else can we do but believe, said Georgie. We have to hope for the best. Promise me, Georgie Summerfield, said Margie. Promise me you won't sign up. There was a long pause before Alfie's dad spoke again. But you heard what old Bill said, love. It might be easier on me if... And what about me and Alfie? Will it be easier on us? Promise me, Georgie. All right, love, all right. Let's just see what happens, shall we? All them politicians might wake up tomorrow and change their minds about the whole thing anyway. We could be worrying over nothing. The morning after his fifth birthday party, Alfie came downstairs to find his mother in a wash day clothes with her hair tied up in her head. Where's Dad? asked Alfie. He's gone out. Gone out where? Oh, I don't know, she said. You know your dad never tells me anything. An hour later, Alfie was sitting in the front parlor drawing in his sketchbook while Margie took a rest from the washing and Granny Summerfield, who'd come round for what she called a bit of a gossip, held the newspaper up to her face and squinted at the print, complaining that they made it too small. The door opened and to Alfie's astonishment, a soldier marched in. He was tall and well-built, the same size and shape as Alfie's dad, but he looked a little sheepish as he glanced around the room. Alfie couldn't help but be impressed by the uniform a khaki-colored jacket with five brass buttons down the center, a pair of shoulder straps, trousers that tucked into knee socks, and big black boots. But why would a soldier just walk into their living room, he wondered. He hadn't even knocked on the front door. But then the soldier took his hat off and placed it under his arm, and Alfie realized this wasn't just any soldier, and it wasn't a stranger either. It was Georgie Summerfield. It was his dad. And that was when Margie dropped her knitting on the floor, put both hands to her mouth, and held them there for a few moments before running from the room and up the stairs while Georgie looked around at his son and mother and shrugged his shoulders. I had to, he said finally. You can see that, can't you? I had to. We're finished, said Granny Summerfield, putting the newspaper down and turning away from her son as she looked out the window where more young men were walking through their own front doors wearing uniforms just like Georgie's. We're all finished. And that was everything that Alfie remembered about turning five.
Thank you.